the next up, Peter Stott from the Met Office. Okay. So I'd like to uh, expand and pick up on some of the points that Freddie was making. Um, really to, to say that climate change is with us now, it's affecting us now. As Freddie says, that means the risks of extreme weather are changing uh, for some, certainly for some types of extreme, in some cases increasing, in other cases potentially decreasing, in other cases maybe not actually changing. Um, a second point is that it's about making decisions in the face of climate change as it's affecting us today. And, 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 and a point I'd like to amplify on that's, that's, that's affected me, I think, is that when people have been affected by uh, weather extremes, they are very exercised about what this means in terms of climate variability and climate change because they have to make decisions as a result of that. Um, and um, thirdly, we need, we need the science, as, as Freddie said, we need the science to underpin that to allow people to make better decisions. And I'm going to go on and talk about, um, particularly about the whole issue of, of operational attribution, about how we can help people make decisions um, in the face of, of the events that are happening in the here and now. And uh, as Freddie says, both, both her group in Oxford and my group in the Met Office, uh, we are, in fact, we are collaborating together and, and working to develop this type of science. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, so, so this is the example I want to give to you that brought home to me how being affected by extreme weather really is important to people. And, and this is, uh, we're going to talk about Australia for a bit uh, and, and amplify a little bit about what Freddie said about Australian uh, heat waves and, and how we can make some pretty confident statements there. This was um, taken, photograph taken on the 4th of January 2013 and it was, I was over there for an IPCC meeting, an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change meeting, which I've been involved in, in writing the fifth assessment report. You may have heard about that. That has new and stronger evidence about the role of human influence on climate. And we were there for this lead author meeting uh, at this time. And this is taken from the conference center looking across Hobart Bay towards the Tasman Peninsula. And you can see over there the fires. This is the smoke coming from the fires on the Tasman Peninsula. And there was one particular family that were, that were affected. There were many families, and I'll say a little bit more about a couple that I met. Um, but one in particular was the Holmes family, and they've talked a lot in the media, to the media about this, and, and it, they, they survived, thankfully. But this is, this is the family sheltering under the pier in front of their house. This is Tammy Holmes, the grandmother of these children, and um, the mother of the children had gone to a funeral, actually, in Hobart. And she was, she was, the fire had come in behind her, and she couldn't get back. And this family had to run down to the pier and take shelter where there was some air to breathe underneath the pier. And it really brought home to me how these are people who are used to fires in Australia, but they had no time in order to escape, or virtually no time. They could escape. They went down to the pier. The, the grandfather of these children who took this photograph then, after a couple of hours of sheltering here, and having sent actually the photograph on his mobile phone to the, to the mother of the children, in his words, to reassure them that everything was OK, <laughs> Um, then escaped in a boat um, and, and made it to safety. This is, their ha this is looking back at the pier. This is the photograph I took of their house uh, or, or one, of their, one of their buildings, uh, of their home. Um, and I gave a lecture the following the, the IPCC meeting. I gave a public lecture with a bit like this to people uh, in, in Hobart. And, and people really wanted to know, is this part of climate change? Are we going to get more of this type of event? And as Freddie has already alluded to, this is, this is about understanding the impacts. It's about understanding both the, the, the heat wave and, and the impacts on the fires. Um, I actually met a couple at this meeting who had a very similar experience to this, and the, the man uh, very phlegmatically told me that they had to do exactly the same thing. They had to run out of the house to almost no notice, and the only thing he saved, thankfully, was a memory stick with his almost completed PhD thesis on it. So he was very happy about that, but there was nothing else left. So this is, the, this is the conditions on the 4th of January. There was a baking hot, I mean, Australia is a hot continent, right? But it was, it was unusually hot. And uh, Hobart, Tasmania is down here. And there was a northerly wind. There was what's called a fern wind, which is when the wind descends down the mountain sides and warms up through, through compression of the air. And it was 41.7 degrees Celsius in Hobart, which was the, the highest temperature that they had recorded in the 100 year or so record. Um, and um, there have been some, some studies of this, as Freddie has already um, mentioned, there have been some studies of this 
looking at these extreme temperatures. And they are really, in terms of the temperatures at least, they are very, very clear that we are seeing unusual temperatures. And this was, we, we, um, I'll go on to say that we, on Monday actually, we released a report, and I'll say a little bit more about this, looking at extreme weather events of, of last year, of 2013. And it seems that I made a, a quote, this is my quote actually, that I, I, I came up when I was talking to one of the reporters off the cuff a bit, I said, the chance of observing such temperatures in the world without climate change is almost impossible to imagine. It's almost impossible to, to see how that could be based on our, all our understanding. And, and to illustrate that, as this, is, this is why we, we said, or I said that, and why the, the Australian researchers who did the work were saying something similar. So this, this, this green distribution of temperatures, which you can see goes from minus one to plus one degrees Celsius, um, that's the range of temperatures you would expect of Australian average temperatures. That is the range of temperature uh, excursions you would expect, as estimated by this paper by Sophie Lewis and David Crowley, that is the expected range you would expect if we had not changed the climate. And these lines over here are the actual annual temperatures over Australia in 2013. So I think you can see that, that those, those temperatures, and the reason there are two lines is due to technical, technicalities of the paper, there were two possible measures you could use, but the point is that both of them are really well outside that green distribution. And that's where this almost impossible comes in. It's, it's, there are many, many thousands of years in these simulations. And um, the, the, the actual observations lay well, well outside. Now, if you look at this blue distribution, these are simulations which represent the author's best estimate of what the climate is today. And you can see it's a very different distribution. It's a very different climate. And what was observed according to those estimates, lies, it's, it's towards the warm end of that distribution, but it's not that unlikely. It's not as extreme, as, it, as extraordinarily extreme, if you like, in the green one. It, it is something that we would expect to happen every now and again uh, and, and in the current world. Um, and it's these types of statements. It's still a, it's still a probabilistic-based statement. It's still talking about the risk, as, as Fred has explained, but for such temperature excursions, then we have very strong confidence uh, that what we are looking at is a very much increased risk due to anthropogenic climate change. Um, and in fact, in this, in this particular report that came out on, Wednesday, on Monday, there were five different groups who looked at this in five different ways and effectively came to the same conclusion. Um, so what about the UK? I just thought I'd, I'd show a couple of these to, to be a, sort of be topical. It's, it's, um, these are data that we collect in the uh, Met Office, Hadley Center, and we're looking like we might be, um, we may or may not be the warmest year on record, it's a bit early to say, but so far it's the warmest. Um, we have a record going back to, to the late 17th century actually, and you can see there's a lot of year-to-year -year variability when we look at UK temperatures, but there is an overall warming trend with lots of variations. Uh, we've had the driest, you may have heard on the news, we've had the driest September since 1910, so this is shown over here, which is our, the maps that we produce. It, it's missing a couple of days, but the, the, the story won't change here. I'm, I'm, I want to make a point about this, actually. You can see the whole country is, is particularly dry. Many, case, many places, it's less than 20% of the average rainfall you'd expect in September. But I've just moved to Devon uh, just a month ago, and, and down here in Exeter, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, three, something like two-thirds of the average rainfall in one two-hour storm. And that's why the little region around Exeter, you can see that there there's a little, uh, it's not quite so brown, so it wasn't quite so unusual. And that is to make a point actually about the nature of rainfall. And I want to go on to expand about why effectively it's easier to do this attribution for temperature often, but it's not often easy. It's harder to do it with rainfall. And part of the difficulty is, the, is, the, um, is you have local effects like this. One very intense rainstorm uh, a couple of weeks ago in Exeter in the extra region, uh, you can see how that affects the monthly picture. Uh, temperature, it's a much smoother uh, field you can see there, uh, and that's the nature of temperature. It was also rather warm in September. So why is, I wanted to expand a bit on, on the, the interesting science and the difficult science that underlies all of this, and say a couple of words about why attribution of, of rain, uh, why the heavy rain events, uh, and then of course you're interested in the impacts of that in terms of flooding and drought, why that can be difficult. So this is a, an illustration I took from the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change, like I said that I was involved in writing. It's, uh, it's, it's buried deep in the great 
book of the report in there. But it's quite an interesting figure, this, because it shows the model, the climate model projections of future rainfall that we would expect with the climate models. And hopefully, you, and I've, I've just chosen the, the September, October, November season. So this is the average over September, October, November. Um, and hopefully, you can see some, some, some important features here. So we're expecting a drying in the Mediterranean region, for example. And we're expecting more rainfall at higher latitudes. And this is a, a robust feature of how we expect the climate system to respond in a warming world. But another point I want to make is about the scientific uncertainty. And I won't bore you with, with the IPCC lead author meetings. There was endless discussion about what's called stippling and hatching, which is a way of representing the uncertainties here. So we have stippling, which is the, dot, the dotty things, and hatching, which is the, the liney things. And the point is that wherever there is hatching, that means that the the change is, 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 is relatively small relative to the variability that we know is there. In other words, it's this signal-to-noise issue that we are not, sh we're not really sure about the signal. And also, you'll notice that the UK lies on the boundary between reducing rainfall and increasing rainfall. So we're right on that edge. So in the UK, what that's saying is it's, in this particular measure, it's probably rather difficult to make confident attribution statements. It may be easier in other places, such as the Mediterranean or or very high latitudes, for example. So there are particular challenges, and there are particular challenges for us all here in the UK. A second point I'd like to make is around the role of dynamics as opposed to thermodynamics. And I'll try and explain a little bit what, by what I mean about that. There's a lot of, a lot of interest, uh, a lot of scientific interest in what is happening with the jet stream, the, the, the ribbon of air high up in the atmosphere that, that steers weather systems down, down in the lower troposphere. And this is a schematic that shows these, these winds, these high-level winds, in a particular time when this jet stream is very disturbed. You can see it has, has big excursions. And when you get such big excursions, you can get very extreme weather. You can get very cold weather on one side of it and very warm weather on the other, as, as polar air is swept down to, to mid-latitude locations here, for example, and, and um, subtropical air is, is, is swept north. In particular regions, um, you know, for example, in, in, in terms of, and we had, a, we had scientific um, investigations looking at the drought they've had in California last year. In certain regions of the Earth, this interplay between is this jet stream changing or not? Is its character changing? Is it becoming more variable or not? These are all live scientific questions. Could change how could change the risk of having, say, a drought in California, to give that example. Now, what's this, what do I mean by the thermodynamics? What I'm referring to here is the fact there is more moisture in the atmosphere, and we, we're, we're very confident about this. These are measurements. This is not climate models. These are measurements showing how the amount of moisture in the atmosphere has increased. That's an expected result of a warming atmosphere, which can hold more moisture. Uh, you can see it's pretty clear. These, these Crosses all over, over it is saying it's statistically significant, so this is a robust feature of the observations. What this means potentially is that when the conditions are right to have a heavy rainfall event, um, such as, for example, we had in Exeter just a couple of weeks ago, potentially at least there is more moisture, generally speaking, to feed those storms than there would be without anthropogenic climate change. Now, I hope you can see that if there's an interplay between these two effects, it could be quite subtle and quite difficult to know has the risk of a particular flood changed, or a particular type of flood, has that changed? Has that increased or decreased? Because on the one hand, it could be that the thermodynamic argument is saying there's more moisture, and therefore there's increased risk of flood, but it could be that this dynamic argument is saying, well, actually, the chances of having this type of situation, this type of meteorological situation, has actually reduced. And often this type of discussion, this type of argument, is, is something that we're having when we're trying to do the science that's, that's underpinning this. So to try to address this, um, Freddie and I and other, other colleagues um, from around the world, although I have to say, just to bang the British drum, we're quite strong on this in Britain, aren't we? We've, we've given a bit of focus on this here in the UK on this particular topic, but we have colleagues from around the world who are also, particularly Australia, for example, who work on this too. And one of the things we're doing is producing these reports every year. So we've done three of them so far. I, I am one of the editors of this report, along with three American colleagues. We just produced the latest one just a couple of days ago. And this is all part of bringing this type of information through relatively quickly. So we, we can make these climate model experiments, as, as, as Freddie has described, 
we can try to figure out in the world that we have what is the risk of a particular type of weather event that we've observed recently and how has that changed because we've changed the climate. Um, this just summarizes some of the studies that we've done over the three years. I don't really have time to go into the, all these in great detail, although you could always ask questions, but one point to just refer to what Freddie said earlier is that you can see we have big gaps. So we've got non, no studies so far in South America, for example. We've got relatively few in Africa. We are, however, beginning to get colleagues interested from China and Japan and, uh, um, uh, and Korea, for example. So we're beginning to get scientific colleagues from other parts of the world who are interested in doing this, but there are still big gaps. And that's not because things aren't happening in these countries. It's because, as Freddie said, we, we've not, uh, there isn't the capacity yet, uh, in, often in the developing countries, to do this. But this is hopefully something that will change in future. Um, so I just wanted to finish up with one particular study that I was involved in, a very beautiful part of the world in New Zealand, and give you an example of where we can, we, can, we can do a type of study like this and come to some conclusions. So this was a, a very heavy rainfall event that brought, brought flooding, as you can see, roads being washed away in December 2011 in Golden Bay, New Zealand. I don't know if any, any of you have been to New Zealand. You may be able to imagine it's a very beautiful part of the world on the South Island here. And what happened here was they had what's called an atmospheric river, which is when you get moisture from the subtropics coming down to mid-latitudes. We have it here in the UK too. There was very heavy flooding in Cumbria a few years ago that was a sa exactly the same type of atmospheric phenomenon. And what Sam Dean from NIWA, which is the in, uh, institute in, in Wellington, New Zealand, did was that he looked at these climate models I've been talking about, and he worked out that although there was no evidence that the actual occurrence of these atmospheric rivers had changed, there was evidence that um, the chances of having the types of heavy rainfall that caused this particular impact had increased. And there's quite a bit of uncertainty about that. There's figures between 8 and 32 percent more likely. So it's quite an uncertainty, but nevertheless, there is some evidence there. And that comes about because of this thermodynamic response I've talked about. Um, so I just want to make a few points there then. So in climate change is increasing the risk of many types of extreme weather, but not all. People directly affected are very keen to understand what is happening and what they can do about it, and particularly what this means, of course, for the future, because they need to make decisions. And that is really the motivation for trying to develop this scientific understanding so that we can, we can understand what we need to do in the face of decisions. And if I'm allowed one very quick postscript, I just say that I did recently move to Devon, um, and I had to make a decision because we found, this is 3rd of January, so this is almost a year on from what I was talking about, about Australia, 3rd of January 2014. This is a village called Limpston, which is south of Exeter, very pretty little village. As you can see, Limpston had coastal flooding on the 3rd of January. It actually suffers from all four types of flooding, fluvial, pluvial, groundwater, and coastal flooding. We found a really nice house that we'd like to buy, but then the more we found out about this, the more we realized we're going to have to make a difficult decision about what the flood risk in this house meant for us. So that really brought home to me that that's when you need this information, when you need to make these decisions. Uh, right, thank you for your attention, and I'll pass on to Alice.